Every fork in the road, we'd get a new reading and make sure we weren't we were walking in the right direction. According to the coordinates we were given, the elevation kept increasing, and I started to recognize where we were at somewhat. It was pretty warm, a lot warmer than it should be. At one point, I swear I smelled something burning, but I didn't see any smoke anywhere. It was getting a little past lunchtime, and the girls were starting to get hungry, but they didn't want to say anything. I reached into my bag and got out some breakfast bars I had dug out of the food box before we left the van. I thought I'd remembered only cans, but then remembered there were some breakfast bars as well. I opened two and handed each one without the wrappers. I stuffed the wrappers back in my bag. They both happily ate the breakfast bars, and it gave them renewed momentum to crash up the trail with us. We didn't really worry about being quiet. As counterintuitive as it seemed, being quiet on a trail could be really dangerous. Accidentally sneaking up on an animal with a baby or some such could spell quick disaster. Being noisy gave the animals plenty of time to shoo away. We should have been more cautious about them possibly getting shot by a hunter mistaking them for animals. The reality of the situation, though, was their white and purple camos stood out pretty well. If some if someone idiotically mistook them for an animal and shot at them, it'd be the last mistake they ever made. They looked nothing resembling an animal, for sure, so I didn't worry about that much. We walked a ways, and the bold girl would be pretending to fight a bush with her shield. She'd shield bash it, and then the shy girl would clap. Another shrub defeated along the hiking trail. Eventually, we got to a clearing that ended up being a parking lot next to a proper road. We passed a sign that informed us that we were indeed at an official park destination. The guys all checked their watches and confirmed with our comms security guy that we were, in fact, within the appropriate window, but nobody was there. We didn't really have a plan for what to do in the event that nobody was at the rally point. There wasn't really a plan B. We had enough food to make it back to our prior point, then back to our mountain friend's house, but then what? There ended up being a playground of sorts at the old state park that we were at. The girls were freaking out about wanting to go over there, so we scouted the area. Nobody was around. There were some public restrooms, but they were chained off. They seemed to have been for a long time now. This was normal due to the constant Biscoll Cliffs we had run into. The park service was always the first to get nailed. Our comms guy gave us new frequencies to switch to, so we did. Then we found out in a we fanned out in a defensive form. We found some cover to protect the front with a few guys and a few more at the trail we had came from. It was an amazing coverage, but it was the best we could do. I felt like we were nearing the closing of the window, but the girls weren't bored at the playground, which was cool. I couldn't pin down how long we'd been at the park, maybe less than an hour. Then I started to get a crackle over the radio. Chapter 25, Meeting Face to Face, Afternoon, Day 4 We all looked at each other at the same time. It wasn't a radio malfunction, everyone had heard the crackle. Our comms guy did the long distance check. He had a better radio than the rest of us. It must have been good because everything proceeded. I imagine that the mountain played havoc with our comms trying to punch through and not being able to. Right about when I had that thought, there was a small earthquake. I remember not thinking much of it because after I got over my fear of earthquakes as a kid, they didn't bug me much anymore. The girls were jumping up and down on a rope bridge at the time and didn't realize it. The guys were focused on the vehicles coming up on us and I guess they didn't realize it either. Maybe it was just my nerves. I heard the engines from where I was at, nearby the play structure. The girls heard it a few moments later and hid in the structure where I couldn't see them anymore. I thought about it both ways and decided that them probably hiding wasn't a bad idea. So I left them alone and stayed in my spot. There was a short distance check and several trucks in a van pulled around the corner into view. They pulled around one of the edges of the park and all got out to secure the perimeter. Our XO and comms guy broke cover and went to greet the one that they had recognized. It was a tense few seconds as we were now outnumbered easily three to one. There were introductions and then an understanding. 
I heard whimpering from inside the play structure that sounded like it was being muffled by a mouth. The poor girls probably thought they were going to get sold again. Hopefully they wouldn't bolt, but I didn't know what to do. If I went over there, I'd give away their position and probably scare them. That'd likely betray their trust somehow. They knew that I knew where they were, so I was probably earning their trust by not giving them away. Seemed like a perfectly reasonable kid logic. Someone was coming near me from the side, and I don't think they spotted me yet. One of our guys saw that he was getting close and told, Their guy overcomes. I heard, Friendly over here? I responded, Friendly, break and cover. He responded, Copy, break cover. I got out of my hiding spot, and he was able to spot me. Nice hiding spot. Thanks. And then I told him to not go over to the playing equipment and don't ask why. He said, no problem. Probably assumed it was trapped or something. RxO called us over, and our observation posts were replaced with superior numbers and coverage. I got over there and walked fairly easily on in the conversation. No instructions from command. Your team is to return and secure new strongholds that can be significantly better defended than the prior redoubts. We have a van for you. We have scouted the route, and it's clear for at most the next two hours. The guy talking, I assume, a CO of a group from that eastern part of the state that gave us a gave us a strip map that showed us exactly where we needed to go. Our XO studied it for a second and gave it to our comms guy, who looked at it for a second and nodded and put it in his pocket. You are to rendezvous at that location, establish dialogue with your contact, and prepare for pre-vetted refugees. We all nodded. Anyone that we didn't vet, it will be up to you whether you let them in. You'll know after security and resource assessment what makes the most sense. You're also to set up a comms base station and re-establish contact with the network. We all nodded. Remember, gentlemen, we're community builders. You know what to do. This group of marauders was only the beginning. They were just a test. Words got back to the big city state to the south about what our numbers are, so we're pulling back. There's no way we collectively can hold them off on two fronts, but if we pull back a hundred miles, we'll be well outside their main operative reach. They'll have the stupid city there. There's nothing there anymore anyway. The people will be safely out either north or east. We nodded to each other. You guys did it. You bought time for everyone to get out. They all saw the threat loud and clear. That group was only 300. The next group is probably going to be around 3,000. But thanks to you, nobody will be there for them to mess with. The only holdouts are people we weren't dealing with to begin with. The gangs and people who refused to contribute. The ground rumbled quite clearly this time. This is it, gentlemen. Your next window is closing. We can't guarantee past hours that past two hours that you'll have a safe route. Get going. They saluted us, then took off in their trucks fast. All that was left with a, was a van that was running. We all piled in and noticed the girls still hiding. We drove up alongside it and opened the sliding door. They both broke cover hand in hand, shield in the other, and ran to our van. The rumbling started to get worse. I was sitting closest and reached my hand out. They grabbed it and I helped them in. There was room for them to have their own spot in the back. They climbed in there and we took off quick as they got belted in. We followed the strip map's directions as our comms guy gave directions to our XO. The rumbling hadn't stopped. I hated these turns down the mountain. I always got motion sick and nervous as hell. Thankfully the way back was always on the inside, but I felt like we were still taking the turns a little fast. I popped a meclazine as to not get sick. As we got further down the mountain a few turns, there was bright orange liquid beginning to pool up in the ditch. Lava, are you kidding me? I thought to myself. We crossed a bridge and the lava was slowly bubbling by down below. There were little dabs of lava that definitely wanted to begin crossing the street, which would have made our exit impossible and probably trapped us. I tried not to think about what we would do if we were trapped by the lava. Thankfully, the girls were sitting facing the driver's side and hadn't noticed. None of us said anything. We didn't want to jinx our exit. Thankfully, the lava wasn't oozing enough to overcome the ditch. 
It seemed content enough with filling the ditches and then letting gravity do the rest.